So a massive crowd at the Hampshire circuit and a highly appreciative crowd as well, showing their support for Ricard Rydell, winner of round one of the Auto Trader RAC Touring Car Championship. And round one will also be remembered not just for Ricard Rydell's heroics, but these two, John Cleland and Alain Menu. They put on an amazing show. They were added hammer and tongs for the last two laps of the race, much to the delight of the spectators and to themselves. But yeah, the last two laps, I uh, had a good dice with, uh, with John Cleland. I mean, he's a crafty little bugger. I think he would say that. So man, you said when, um, when the race was finished there, he said, oh, not bad for an old bloke. So maybe I'm not that old after all. Across the year, I'll be looking at some of the different technical aspects of touring car racing. And today, we're going to have a look at tyres. And the reason for that is simple. Thruxton Circuit is the most abrasive in the country when it comes to wearing out tyres. Here's a brand new tyre, as you can see, smooth, but very square-shouldered. Now, this tyre here came off a race car from this morning's race. Look at it. It's very damaged. We've even used a heat gun to try to clear off the old rubber. But look at the pits, the dents in it. It's basically worn out. Now, because of that, because Thruxton is so damaging with its high-speed corners, which literally grind the tyre away, expect a lot of the teams this afternoon to opt to change their left tyres rather than both their fronts. Such importance is being put on this new touring car format that all the F1 Supremos with a vested interest were here. Frank Williams from the williams Renault team, Dave Richards who runs ProDrive, that's the team that looks after the Hondas, and Tom Walkinshaw, the head of TWR Volvo. <laughs> well, I think you'll have to wait and see. I think that, uh, you know, being the first race with pit stops in it, I think a lot of people were pretty nervous, so I wouldn't be surprised if there's some erratic pit stops uh, and some erratic pit stop strategy, but, uh, you know, I think overall it's a good thing and it adds another dimension to it and it allows all members of the team either to help win the race or lose it, doesn't it? So they can really be involved. It's good fun. So, will the Formula One teams bring their experience into play and actually win this one in the pits, or will it be fought out on the track? The big change this time is that Menu is on row two, right behind Ricard Rydell. Rydell muffed the start last race. They'll have to get it right this time. John Watson's got the rest of the grid, and he counts it down for us. Pit stops and 32 laps of the 2.35 mile Thruxton circuit as Ricard Rydell is joined in the front row, this time by Anthony Reid in his Nissan. Alan Menu in the Renault and James Thompson in his Honda make up row two. David Leslie in Nissan, Jason Plato in the Renault, row three. Row four's old Vauxhall, John Cleland and Derek Warwick. Row five, Peter Cox in his Honda, Paul Radisich in the Peugeot. Row six sees the independent runners Matt Neal in the Nissan, Tommy Rootstadt in the Renault. Row seven, Jenny Morbidelli in the Volvo, Will Hoy in the Ford. Row eight is Mark Lammer in his Vauxhall, alongside Ivan Muller in the Audi. Row nine, Rob Gravett in the Honda, Craig Baird in the Ford. A record crowd of 32,000 people standing by for round two of the Auto Trader RAC Touring Car Championship. The first of the pit stop races, the red drive on the rev limiter. The Volvo Rickard Rydell fires the afterburner, flames shooting out the back of it, and he's away, and he hasn't muffed the start this time. Rydell away, Reed on one side, Menu looking up the inside, he's got Menu all over him, Reed having a big look down the outside, James Thompson going with him into Allard's on the first lap. And it's almost three abreast as they come out of Allard's up into the complex. It's still Rydell, Reed, Menu battle for that second place. It's not a place you're going to get past Rydell, he knows that complex oh so well. Reed's having a big look up the inside of Menu though. And he's, he's won the shuffle, he's won the shuffle, he's held Menu out, it's Reed in the Nissan in the second place, then Menu, then Thompson, then Leslie in the second of the Nissans as they file around the back of the circuit. 32 punishing laps of Thruxton, pit stops are going to come between lap 5 and lap 22. If you're outside that window, you will be in trouble. This is the fast part of the circuit, and these are the danger laps as well, the opening laps when everything's not as hot as it should be. We had absolute carnage in the first lap, cars going everywhere. James Thompson now challenged so hard in the first race only to lose it filing down into church corner now listen to them like bullets like strafe going over the top of us as they fly through there 125 miles an hour even on their opening laps and I'm pleased to say everybody got through church cleanly on the opening lap this time Jason Plato in the second Renault having a look down the outside of David Leslie in the second of the Nissans and somebody's going off in a club chicane Tommy Rustad got it all wrong into the entry of that chicane, ended up at the tyre barrier, no damage to him, but end of the day for the car. Did he jump or was he pushed? That's the big question as we take our leaders now around lap one. Rydell in the Volvo still leading. 
on board now with Rustad. Well, that's the remains of his car in here. He's obviously okay. Yeah, he's fine. He's moving around, getting out of the car. Great disappointment, of course. Fine performance in qualifying and practice. And uh, a man we're going to have to keep an eye on. That independence going to challenge a lot of the works cars. Back up front now, and Jason Plato coming under some real pressure from John Clellan in the box hall. Clellan finished a very strong fourth in race one, and he's desperate to get a Renault behind him again. And after his season last year, John Clelland and Derek Warwick are bursting to get near the front, and Clelland's charging, pushing Jason Plato all the way around Goodwood Corner. And look at the suspension on that Renault, brilliantly handling car. It's got such soft suspension, such a well-sorted-out car, they can have lots of suspension travel, just what you need around here. Such a fast circuit, such a bumpy circuit especially as you go through here, Church Corner. Well, you have to give it a dab on the brakes as you come through Church, but it is mighty quick, and it's important to have the speed off the corner because this is the part of the circuit where you'll want to try and pass, but not this time. Anthony Reid still holds that second place. And Alain Menu, well, he came strong through in fifth in the first race. He wants to get to the front in the second. So it's Rydell in the Volvo leading, followed by Reid, then Menu. Thompson and Leslie in the second of the Nissans, then Jason Plato and Cleland and Warwick in the two Vauxhalls. On board now with Evan Muller in the first of the Audis. As we go out round the back of the circuit, heading down towards the complex. And Audi having a really tough time. Tommy Rustad makes his way back to the pits. And this, in fact, is going to be a little view, I think, of what happened to Rustad. There we see him coming across the front. That's the Paul Radisic Peugeot. And in reality, Rustad didn't give Radisic any room. Well, here's the view from Rustad's car. He's moving up towards the complex. Didn't count on Paul Radis. It's being well, moving up alongside him. And into the wall we go. That's the end of that race. Back now with our second place fight. Look at the smoke pouring off the rear tyre of Reed's car. Hard under brakes into the complex. Menu climbing all over the back of him and Reed trying to hold him off. Meantime, this man, Ricard Rydell, is clearing off into the distance. Just as we saw in race one, but Alain Menu still looking to find a way past Anthony Reed in the Nissan. But Menu now coming up into the complex once again, closes up to the back of the Nissan. Can he do it this time? He's got to look for a way down the inside. He's certainly showing the nose. Yes, he has. That was easy as well. Why does Menu do it there all the time? Well, it was a very uncharacteristic Reed manoeuvre as well. He's usually much tougher than that. I don't know whether he's got a problem, but he really, really lost that place quite easily. Yeah, he appeared just to give away the place. But look again, look through the windscreen. You can already see that, well, there's an awful lot of something on the windscreen of Reed's Nissan. What a great shot of Alain Menu and the Renault flying around the back of the circuit. Look at that suspension working out. Very bumpy circuit and very fast. And the Renault suspension, which has been one of the strengths of the car, is really helping it through there. Anthony Reid trying still to hang on to the back of it. Big shot of flame there as he lifts off the throttle to go through church, then back on the power as fast as you can. And look up ahead, not to the car in front, but look at the weather in front. And they put on a wet race sign. Now that's something I find rather unusual. Normally you declare a race wet before the start. But circumstances here, big black clouds coming over the circuit, very rapidly indeed. It is now a wet race. It's up to the teams to determine when they make a pit stop for wet weather tyres, not down to the organiser. And the bad news for Ricard Rydell is that Menu has now passed Anthony Reid. That means he's going to start the chase. It was great news while he was held up. Now Menu can really start working him over. And speaking of workovers, here's James Thompson starting to work over the back of Anthony Reid's Nissan. We're coming into the complex, looking down the inside. That's the Swedish shuffle. That's the wonderful Ricard Rydell manoeuvre that's worked so well for him. And now Thompson's pulled it up as well. Someone's watching. Anthony Reid really beginning to struggle, his teammate David Leslie right behind him, Jason Plato also trying to make this battle for fourth place, three cars in fourth place, I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, we've got Reid, Thompson, Leslie and Plato, you could throw a blanket over all four of them. Great shots on board late Jason Plato's car now, and look, on the right hand side of the screen, that's David Leslie making a pass on his teammate Anthony Reid, he's through and he's taken Jason Plato with him. And really, Anthony Reid once again in the space of three corners has let three cars go by. Now, we did see the screen of Reid's car looking very dirty indeed. Whether it's that, whether it's just something mechanical, we don't know. But now, further pressure, first of the two Vauxhalls, comes up behind Anthony Reid. And there you can see, just out of the corner, a little flap. It looks like one of the doors on the left-hand side of the Nissan isn't properly closed. I'll tell you what, you'd want them properly closed soon. It looks like a monsoon's heading our way, judging by those clouds overhead. What a great example of how different drivers use different ways through that chicane. Some straight lining, some opting to avoid the hardest of the impacts. 
And now it's John Clellan's turn to make his way past Anthony Reid as they come out of Allard's corner up into the complex. And look ahead, John, as well. At the same time, we've got Jason Plato making a move on the outside of David Leslie. Plato on the left, Leslie on the Nissan on the right, and Plato's got him on the outside. Leslie trying to find a way back over that jump we talked about going onto the back part of the circuit, but no way Plato's got. Yeah, well, he has he got it. Leslie's having another look back, but I don't think he's going to hold him. I think that's the last David's going to see of Jason Plato. And for the first time in this race, Jason Peter's actually got some clear air ahead of him. And also, for the first time in a British Touring Car Championship race, the pit lane is open for pit stops. Yeah, well, we're eligible for pit stops from now, but what are they going to do? They've got weather they can think about, John, as well. Well, I imagine most people are going to go to about lap 16 or 17, about half distance. But we've got weather, we've got big black clouds, and the one thing no team manager wants to do is be forced into bringing his car in a second time to change onto wet weather tyres. So I think they're going to hang out there as long as they can. But traffic will also be a major factor. If you get hung up in traffic, it is better to bring your car in, put on fresh rubber. Six people are allowed to do that. Tear off those yellow signs below the driver's name on both sides of the car and get you back out into the race. Well, let's keep an eye on those clouds. In the meantime, let's keep an eye on this action because Derek Warwick has just surged up the inside of Anthony Reid, who is storming to the back of the field as fast as he possibly can. I've lost count of how many places he's dropped, and I'm sure he has too. That's Peter Cox now in the Honda on the left, trying to have a look down. Reid is in all sorts of trouble. He's locked it up. Radisic on the other side, giving him a bit of a serve. He's got nowhere to go. <laughs> like running around inside of a car park, trying to park. He actually wants to get off this motorway as quickly as he can, and everyone's monstering him. Radisic now on board with Radisic, having a look down the outside of Peter Cox, moving up now to Noble Corner. This is tricky because there's a big bump right in the middle of it, just about there. Whoa! Big sideways movement as he heads. He's really working hard. Yeah, indeed. You can just see how much work in the cockpit of the Persia, Paul Radisic. One would normally associate this quiet man from New Zealand as being very gentle in the car, but well, he's a monster, I can tell you. Look at this down through church and the wheel absolutely getting ripped between his hands. He had power steering problems in the first race. I trust he's not having them now. Meantime, back up front, look at this. Real pressure. Alain Menu is all over the back of Ricard Rydell. A couple of laps ago, I said he was disappearing into the distance. Not now. And then you're really beginning to stalk Radell as they come through Allard. The pressure right on the Swedish driver from the Swiss driver. Come up now, long sweeping left hander. Break hard down into the he's complex. Through. He's through. He's had a big look down the inside. And Rydell's been outboxed at his own game. That's the reverse of the Rydell pass, but it's he's just stalled past him. Yeah, but look at that. Rydell, although he's coming back, the reality is I think he's losing grip. This is a much, much longer race. You've got to work it out. Well, there's a great view now. We can see whether or not Menu's going to pull away. We're looking back from Menu towards Rydell. Now we're looking forwards towards Menu from Rydell. And oh, how he, how, how he must feel now. He yeah, had that lead for so long. What's happening? Is he actually pulling away? Yeah, I would say that Menu's pulling away very comfortably. But there's one factor here this afternoon you're going to take into account. Tom Walkinshaw has flown back from Argentina from the Grand Prix there overnight. And he's in the pits. He masterminds those pit stops. He loves it. So, so maybe it's just terror that's made Ricard right now lose a place then. But as you can see, moving down the back straight now, up towards the club chicane, the clouds are getting blacker and the gap's getting bigger for Ricard Rydell. A couple of things are coming to play here, I guess. It's a longer race this time, so maybe Rydell's murdered his tyres and that's how Menu's caught him. Or maybe because Menu didn't have to come through the field this time, he started on the second row of the grid. Maybe that's made it easier for him. Well, clearly for Menu, once he's got clear air, that's a lot easier. But Rydell also had the same clear air. This Volvo is a very quick car, but Thruxton is notoriously hard on tyres. And if you've got a problem, well, it'll come quicker rather than later. And I think I spoke too soon, John. I said that Plato was going to clear off into the distance, but David Leslie is now in front of Plato again, and now Plato is having to repass him, or try to repass him, do all that work again. He certainly got alongside him, but Leslie was able to lead out of the complex. And for Jason Plato, that's the waste of another lap. He's going to have to wait, in fact, until he gets back up to the club chicane before he's got any realistic chance of finding a way around the Nissan once again. What a great ding-dong battle for fourth it is, though. Menu out in front in first place, followed by Rickard Rydell. Then it's James Thompson third. Then these two, Leslie in fourth and Jason Plato in fifth place. Plato must be wondering, I was ahead of Leslie. I got past him. I lost the place. What have I got to do? Do I actually think about going into the pits, making an early pit stop for tyres? And of course, all the risks associated with that. This is the first time we're going to see touring cars make pit stops. Things can go wrong. Will the jacks all work? Will it be done on time? Will it make up time? Will it lose time? 
all the time he's sitting behind David Leslie and those four tyres he started this race on are not very happy. Ivan, we are ready for you, we are ready for you. Ivan, we are ready for you. Ivan, in the corner. Okay, speed limit. Speed limit, careful. Ivan Muller in and look at the windscreen in the ID. Car jacked up. Two front wheels changed. Guns back on the nuts. Need the windscreen. I lost them two laps ago. What a mess that's made at the front of that car. It is ruining this place. Look at that. You can't see through it at all. That's not just dirt. It looks like a lot of oil, but I think a lot of the problems also, these cars don't always use glass for windscreens. They use a material called color carbonate, and you put oil onto it, then you put screen cleaner, it just becomes okay. an amalgam. And it, look, you can hardly even see down the pit lane from the front of that ID. And just wait till you've got water on it as well. Oh, he stalled it, he stalled it. That's not going to help the pit stop at all. They drilled so hard, these guys. They all work so hard. Make sure the pit crew do the job properly, but then the drivers go and stall the cars on the way out. Now, here's a big challenge. Here's Plato doing it all over again. Ah, uh, that's better. That's that fourth place I've been fighting over. Plato slipping down the inside of Leslie and finally getting past him, going into the complex. Back over the start-finish line now, trying to get a bit of air between him and make it stick this time. You don't want to be keeping on passing the same person. I don't know whether or not it'll affect Leslie's pit stop strategy, but in comes Reed and in comes Cox at the same time. Anthony Reed, who started second in this race, has dropped all the way down through the field. And again, another car, Charlie, that seems to be in trouble with the windscreen. You can see the team going to work to try and clear it. And interestingly as well, Peter Cox opting to change both the left-hand wheels. We saw the Audi of Muller change the front. Good stop from Honda, straight back out again. But because this circuit's so abrasive, and look at the windscreen on that Nissan. I don't know if he can see anything, I sure can't. There is no way Anthony Reid can drive a race car like that. The windscreen on his side of the car, the right-hand side, is absolutely opaque. Here comes the first of our good old boys, John Clellan in one of the vectors coming into pit. Clellan too, opting to change the outside tyres, the tyres that get the real belting around here because of the high-speed corners and the abrasion of the track. Some problem on the left rear. The rear suspension, Charlie, there's not enough droop to allow the wheel to come down to clear the wheel arch cleanly. That's what's causing so much trouble here on that left rear. That's frustrating waiting for a driver it says speed limit you have to control yourself leaving it's so easy to drop the clutch blow the throttle and exceed the speed limit especially when you're slightly cross with your pit crew because things didn't go according to plan rejoining the circuit though and as you notice as once again poor old Anthony Reid back in the pit for another windscreen clean okay I can't see I can't see a thing um, can you clear it off just clean that off on the left hand side too pit crew will be able to get jobs at traffic lights cleaning windscreens in the off-season. They'll be pretty well practiced by the end. But there must be an awful lot of liquid or fluid somewhere around this racetrack. We've not seen anything obvious from any of these cars, but clearly with Reed and other cars, they've just come in with windscreens that are completely covered in a mixture of grime, oil, rubber, whatever, and it's causing big, big problems. Yeah, well, I think the key is going to be, or the clue is going to be, who hasn't got oil on their windscreen, and I guess we'll see that as the pit stops unfold. Will Hoy, first of the Fords, now going into the pits. It looks like he's absolutely crawling as he goes along the pit lane, and that's because he is. There's a 30-mile-an-hour speed limit in this pit lane, and the Ford has got to travel the full length. Now, these guys should be pretty quick. We did a lot of drilling with them the other day. Me on the front, will you, with a lollipop. In the meantime, he's been Cliff challenging. He's challenging more Morvidelli, and there's contact. Wing mirrors everywhere. Certainly is contact. That looked to be not uh, the kind of thing that would be considered correct, but Gianni Morbidelli... He's raced touring cars in Italy. He knows what it's like to have to muscle your way around the field. I don't know what's going on. This is still Will Hoy, still stuck in the pit. They must have a wheel problem there somewhere. Eventually out, but uh, that's a very, very long stop. Yeah, Will Hoy, pretty much at the end of the pit lane, had some advantage. You get on the throttle almost immediately. You leave the pits. Well, there's a very smoky car. In fact, it's a Peugeot. And in fact, it is Tim Harvey. And Tim Harvey has never moved that quickly in his yeah, life. The car's on fire. The marshals are trying to find out. The pit crew are trying to find out where it is. Might be an oil leak. Fire around the catch tank, maybe coming off the exhaust. Of course, for a driver in an enclosed car like a touring car, any smoke in the car, any sense of fire is always a problem. You want to be in the pits and out as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, that's happening back at the front. Ricard Rydell has closed back in on Alain Menu. This fight is far from over. He's really moved back in on him. Menu got past him a couple of laps ago, but he's all over him again. Well, 
once Menu got the lead, I expected to see him disappear, but Ricard Rydell has reeled him back in again. The Volvo, with all the new modifications, looks very strong. And here's our third place man, James Thompson, heading into the pits. A smooth pit stop, relatively, for Peter Cox's teammate already. James crawling up to his pit lane spot now. Also opting for a left-hand side tyre change. Now let's, let's have a look at the rear of the Honda. Much, much easier access for the mechanics. The wheel comes off and on very much more easily than you saw for the Vauxhall. Vauxhall may have to do a little bit of work around the rear of their car. Yeah, I think the Vauxhall also had a bit of a problem because it only came up on one side. Maybe they had an air jack problem and that was what did it. And there's contact. That's Morbidelli and one of the Fords. That's bad and that's actually damaged the side of his door on the way past. I don't know whether Morbidelli was helped along or whether he just pirouetted and Baird picked him up on the way through. But Baird got a very heavy dig in that right front door and you can see around the back of the car the rear valance also flapping in the breeze as he goes through Allard but look at the right hand door of Morbidelli's car and the wipers going in synchronization and little bits of trim hanging off the side of the car so Morbidelli's going to go straight into the pits. Yeah, what a mess those, the pair of those cars look like a pair of old midnight minicabs don't they? Bits hanging off them everywhere at least he's out of the danger now he's out of the chicane and out of harm's way but they're not ready for him look they weren't expecting him to come in obviously unscheduled stop where are the tyres where are the wheels what's going on? Let's have another look at this issue well, the back of Morbidelli's car was drifting out. He jumped off the throttle. Baird didn't expect it. There was contact. Then just a compound, and they did it again. Yeah, Baird will be lucky if he avoids a black flag with that door waving around. Meantime, back at the front, and here is Ricard Rydell, and here is Alain Menu, and Menu is very aware he's there. All over him. He's closer than a lap before. He's absolutely reeled him in. And Alain Menu has only got one car in his sights. That's ahead of him. Anthony Reid, this is a lap car, but when you're in a race with these two cars, the Volvo and the Renault, the last last thing you want is traffic at a critical part of the circuit. And finally, Morbidelia, for an unscheduled pit stop, gets back on track. Back with our leaders now, and that's Rickard Rydell challenging Menu. We're back into the complex, and he's having a big look. Tries his old Swedish shuffle, but it doesn't work this time. But he's right under the boot lid. That's from the roof of Menu's car, and you don't have to look far back to see where Rickard Rydell is. He's weaving from one side to the other like a hungry shark, trying to find a way past. We're doing more than 120 miles an hour here as we turn into Goodwood Corner. And he's not getting any distance whatsoever. Any distance whatsoever on Rydell. In fact, Rydell's almost looking around the outside of him as they go down towards Church Corner. Bit of a dab under brakes. As Rydell goes into Church, he's been weaving around the track. For me, that's a driver trying to distract the other driver. When you do these things, you try to put your car in the mirror of the car you're trying to pass. That, to me, is what Rydell's trying to do. Look at him catch up as they come into the chicane. Yeah, and that, re that really is being held up, isn't it? There's a lap car. That's no problem for them. But he's seriously in his way. Obviously, Rydell's got the horsepower on him, or at least the speed on him out the back of the circuit. It might be. And they're both going into the pits. Rydell's been with him the whole time. Now the race turns to the pits. Volvo stops soonest because it's got a pit near to the entrance. Renault stopped much later at their pits towards the exit. This is a battle between two teams. They're used to doing this in Formula One, but it's the first time in touring cars. Well, that's right, Delaway. That was a lightning fast stop. Lightning fast stop. Menu's still in there. Okay, the tear offs are up, his car's down, but there goes Rydell. Rydell's pulled out of the pits, he's beaten out our menu, and the difference was cleaning the windscreen. Yes, indeed, another car affected by very, very dirty windscreen. Somebody out there is chucking out liquids, oils, whatever, and it's caused now the race leader, or second place, depending where you see him in the race, Big, big problems. Alain Menu lost time because of that windscreen cleaning time. And there's Gianni Morbidelli in the second Volvo trying to run a little bit of interference to distract Menu further, help his teammate, help Rydell get a little bit of an advantage. Rydell did not need to clean his windscreen. Alain Menu did need to clean his windscreen. I wonder if there's something significant in that. Well, we haven't seen anything from the Volvos. They're running strong, no problems whatsoever. As we have Matt Neal in the independent Nissan into the pits. Now, it's wonderful to see that car running again. Remember, it was given an almighty shunt into the first race when it punted Will Hoy off, that big tangle in the first lap of race one. It's out there and it's running and it's circulating well. The tear-offs off, car up there, opting to change the front tyres, not the rears. Doing a very good job. Sadly, Matt lets the car stall and loses vital time in the pit lane. Well, Matt Neal had a brilliant qualifier, and he was also interestingly running fourth outright at that point. 
got a great drive. Now this becomes the battle for fourth, and it's the same four people duking it out. We've got Peter Cox, then the pair of the good old boys in the Vectras, closely followed by Jason Plato in the second of the Renaults. They've been swapping leads left, right, and center. It's a fabulous scrap. And look how hard Warwick's working. That car was well sideways, the first of the Vauxhalls coming over the top of the hill. Jason Plato, of course, trying to find a way past John Clement. Can he get it done? Well, he's certainly got inside him. Yes, he has. Good pass from the man from Oxford. Great racing, nose to tail. He's not going to have any of this, though. I'm back passing you, mate. Don't you worry about it. He had great success in staving off LMNU in the first race, and he can't out look at his windscreen as well. He's been oiled up by somebody, and you can't particularly see where he's going. And he's also been in for his pit stop, so whatever happened has happened since that pit stop. So there's still oil somewhere around this track. I don't know whether we're going just looking through a haze of multigrade or whether those clouds are getting thicker, but it looks to me as though the sky is really closing in. It's a filthy windscreen, but it looks as though the heavens are about to open. A great shot of it as we head back up towards the chicane, and that's where the weather's coming from. Derek Warwick now under pressure from Jason Plato. Comes into the chicane, Plato closes right up to the back of the Vauxhall Vectra. Lift the wheel over the first part of the kerb, stay neat through the second and third, get on the power, accelerate all the way down into Allard's. These four will be shuffling it through all the way to the end. All of their illuminated strips have been ripped off their windscreens. That means all of them are pitted. Wellen still literally driving by Braille as he feels his way around the back of the circuit. Can't see a thing, but they've all pitted. No reason to break up this fabulous battle. Ah, oh, that's ahead of us. That's Plato locking up a wheel and almost losing that coin. He went very deep into that corner, obviously locking up, breaking late. Is that an opportunity for Clellan? Well, give John Cleland any chance at all to pass. He is a racer, 100% Scottish, pure racer. Passenger door coming off, and I need a clean screen. There's bed coming in for a quick wash and go after his tangle earlier on with Morbidelli, but obviously whatever it is that's causing the oil out there is still doing it. Yes, it is, and finally, Baird realizing you can't drive a racing car with one door flapping in the breeze. It's distracting, and ultimately it is dangerous. Again, oil around the track. We don't know where it's coming. We haven't seen one car yet blow oil anywhere, yet it's still getting on windscreens. Drivers coming in, complaining, getting screens cleaned. Where is it? I don't know. Well, here's the battle with the leaders once again. That's Alain Menu moving onto the back of Ricker. And look at the back of Rydell's car. It's filthy. It's covered in oil. You can hardly read the Volvo sign on the back. Maybe that's where it's coming from. There's never been any oil on the screen of a Volvo, but believe me, there's tons of it on the boot lid. Well, we saw at the start of this race, joked about it, the flames coming out of the back of Rydell's car, so it's obviously fueling very heavily. But is that fuel you can see, just unburnt fuel or more than that? Well, certainly fuel can give you a very, very dirty windscreen, but, you know, looking at the boot of the car, that to me is more than fuel. I would expect that to be something like very, very fine oil mist or vapor. And uh, if it's on the boot of the Volvo, it's going to be on the windscreen. Look at Alan Menu right over the back of the Volvo as they come around. Goodwood gets up inside him. And he's got, no, him. he's got the job done. What an absolutely amazing challenge, driving around the inside of somebody on the fast back of that circuit. And Charlie, we got one single spot of rain on that camera lens as they came around Goodwood Corner. So now we're getting oil on the windscreens. We're getting water on the track. If you get water on the windscreen with oil, you're in big trouble. Well, if that's the case and uh, Rickard's windscreen is clean, that'll play right into his hands because you can bet your bottom dollar menu screen will be covered with oil. So one application of the wipers with the water and the oil and it might be curtains, <laughs> literally for him. The one thing you must never do once you get oil on the screen is put the wipers on because you will have literally nothing but white emulsion from the oil and water mix. That was an extremely strong pass from Menu, though, wasn't it? Out the back of the circuit. He lined him up. Bear in mind they're doing more than 120 miles an hour as they do that. Here's our scrap still for fourth place. And our friend Jason Plato has moved up the queue once. He's got both of the Vauxhalls behind him now, and he's having a crack at Peter Cox in the second of the uh, Hondas. But just ahead of them is one of the independents, Roger Main in his Honda. And the last thing you want when you're involved in a battle as these two are, well, Roger Main pulled out of the way so quickly, they didn't even see him. It looked like he made for the hills, actually. Went and joined the spectators. Didn't want to get tangled up with this awesome foursome at all. And there they are still, all locked nose to tail. How many times have we seen the two Vauxhalls nose to tail last year? They're still doing it this year. I guess it's a tribute to the balance of the pair of the drivers in them. But right now, the lead two in this, Cox and Plato, just look to be getting an edge on it and slightly breaking up the party. Well, this battle for fourth place getting very intense. Peter Cox and Jason Plato fighting cat and dog all around the back. Plato once again puts the Renault inside the Honda as they come out of Goodwood. Now the charge all the way down to Church. 
awesome corner. Uh, what nerves of steel. What an incredible pass by Jason Plato. Down the inside, steaming into church at more than 100 miles an hour. I think it absolutely flummoxed Peter Cox. He lifted to let him pass. And now the box stalls have got the momentum. Steaming up on the outside. Cox moves to cover, but to no avail. In fact, you can see both of them slowed themselves down there. That's really given John Cleland a big run through church. And he's got him. He's got him. He's moved up the inside of Cox. That's because Plato and Cox slowed each other up going through church. And that's allowed the box stalls to close in. And look at Derek Warwick now being frustrated. He got the momentum off the corner. Contact between Cleland and Cox going into Allard. Warwick slides up in between his teammates. Also looks to try and make another place on Cox. And this battle going on all the way in the closing laps of the race. Warwick making a big lunge down the inside now into the complex and making it stick as well. He steam past Cox. Cox is actually having a terrible run as he did in the first race where he slid back through the field. And look, as we speak, there's more rain now. You can see it on the lens of the camera and that's a really big problem. We've already got oil on the track, or at least on some of the cars, and with water added to it, that's going to make life much worse. Back at the chicane, a serene Alan Menu leads a serene Matt Neal. He's the leading independent currently running in 10th place. He's had a real up and down weekend, Matt Neal. He actually qualified fifth outright at the start of this, an astonishing performance for an independent. But unfortunately for Matt, that was excluded because of a technical infringement, so he had to start the first race from the back of the field. Now, meantime, of course, Matt Neal has now found himself in this battle between Alain Menu and Ricard Rydell in second, and that's really going to play into Menu's hands. But I've got a funny feeling that Matt Neal's rather enjoying his brief encounter with the two race leaders. And as we watch these two, look at the, the heavens are opening. We're on the last lap, thank goodness for that, but the heavens have absolutely opened. That looks like rain. That's Rob Gravett in the foreground. He's spun. Everyone's being caught out by this. They're on slick tyres, remember? We are on the last lap, but they've still got to get home. We've had snow, rain, oil, every condition you can imagine, and these cars are on slick tyres. There is zero grip out there. They've just got to pussy put it all the way around to this last lap. And it is actually snowing. Obviously, the Renault team aren't worried about LM Menu finishing first. They're all running up to the wall to congratulate him, and down the last straight he comes, heading into the chicane for the last time. Still confident, obviously, straight across the curbs in spite of the appalling weather. Just a quick glimpse of Ricard Rydell behind him. What an incredible drive. What an amazing race. Seesaw, losing the lead once and then getting it back again. Well, I think this confirms the confidence that I've seen in Alamenu since the start of the season. He looks sharp. He looks bright. His team see it in him as well. They're doing a great job. Superb win for Frank Williams, who made it back here this afternoon. So Alamenu wins round two and the first of the pit stop races from Ricard Rydell by just over two seconds. James Thompson in third, a solid race from him. Plato and Warwick rounding out the five. Cleland and Cox make it six and seven. They were part of that fabulous four-way dice. And Matt Neal rounds out the top ten. Yeah, but it started to spit. Yeah. And my windscreen was just covered with, I just could not see anything. So I, I kept screaming on the radio that at the pit stop they had to, to clean it. But they only, they only succeeded in cleaning just a little bit. When it started to rain again, it was like, again, I could not see anything. Is that snow or oil? Uh, I think it was, it was uh, probably a fuel from uh, Anthony Reed. First few laps, he was just like... So you had a pit stop problem and you lost the lead. Then what happened? Yeah, and then uh, obviously I wanted to win it, basically. Yeah. How did you get back so, past? Uh, good question. I can't remember what I did. <laughs> I can't remember right now, but uh, it was thin move. Well, uh, he did it quite quickly, so it was quite easy for him. He was um, quite a lot quicker than us in the race, so uh, it made it easier for him. Uh, he was saying he had some oil on his windscreen, so that's why the pit stop took longer than ours. Uh, I was quite pleased with the car and the balance, except that I, I got too much understeer early in the race, and therefore I had to slow down. So after two rounds of the championship, it's a handy eight-point lead for Ricard Rydell from Alain Menu on 22. Jason Plato and James Thompson are locked together on 20 points, with John Cleland making a welcome return for Vauxhall into the top five. He's closely followed by teammate Derek Warwick on six, Morvedelli, Cox, and then the two Nissans of Leslie and Reed rounding out the top ten. And it was a big weekend for Independence debutant Mark Lemmon. He won one of the Independent rounds, Matt Neal won the other. In spite of that, Rob Gravett still manages to head the Independence point score. Mark Lemmer and Matt Neal are locked in second place, followed by Tommy Rudstadt and Roger Mowen as they prepare for rounds three and four of the championship at Silverstone.